Welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Joseph Stewart. Have you ever had anyone ask you, what is scripture? For such a short question, it has the possibility to open up into thousands of answers. For Latter-day Saints, it could be defined as whatsoever God's representatives shall speak when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. This definition is somewhat broader than many other Christian definitions of scripture, incorporating both written and spoken modes of inspiration. At the end of the day, though, scripture must be interpreted by the power of the Holy Ghost for our edification. In the past several hundred years, though, some have looked to academic tools to prove the truth of religious texts. Professionals from fields like history, archaeology, and anthropology have sought to add detail from the empirical record to sacred texts. Those professionals are often women and men of faith. But what are the limits of using academic tools to prove religious truth? And how did that play out in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints during the first decades of the 20th century? In today's podcast, Dr. Matthew Bowman of Claremont Graduate University is going to discuss that with us today, focusing on his article entitled Biblical Criticism, the Book of Mormon and the Meanings of Civilization in the most recent issue of the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. We'll include a copy of the article in our newsletter, which you can subscribe to at mi.byu.edu slash monthly dash mi dash news. Dr. Bowman, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Delighted to be here, Joey. Thanks so much. All right. So you are the Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University. Before we get into your article, what does the Chair of Mormon Studies do? That is a good question. Uh, There are not many of these chairs, and I think we all probably do something slightly different. What I do here at CGU is a couple of different things. First, every semester I teach a class that involves Mormon Studies. And I'm sure we'll talk about that term in a moment in some way. Often these classes are comparative. That is, I will teach a class that that compares, say, the Mormon tradition with Catholic tradition with Protestants in some way. Um, I also direct a thing called the Center for Global Mormon Studies, which tries to promote information and knowledge about members of the Mormon tradition around the world. And I teach students and advise dissertations that explore various aspects of the Mormon tradition in some way. So you use Mormon tradition rather than saying Latter-day Saints or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Does Mormon and Mormonism work as sort of an umbrella term? That's precisely it. Yes, we actually have had several conversations about what term we will use. But we've come to the term Mormon for a couple of reasons. The first is that I have students who are interested in studying members of churches descended from the revelation to Joseph Smith that are not the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I have students who study the Community of Christ, um, which was the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I also have students who are interested in the fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as well. So we use that word Mormon as a way to encompass members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but also some of these other traditions as well. We also use the word because a lot of the work I do and a lot of work that many of my students do is historic. That is, we're looking at the past and we're looking at sources that use the word Mormon to describe these people. Even members of the church who use the word Mormon to describe themselves as well. So the term feels both all-encompassing, but also adds a degree, I think, of historical texture as well. We're going to be discussing your article in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies entitled Biblical Criticism, the Book of Mormon, and the Meanings of Civilization. Before we begin, what is biblical criticism? When did it begin? Where did that term come from? Yeah, that is a good question. So the first thing to say is that biblical criticism does not simply mean criticizing the Bible. Right. I think a lot of people, when they hear that word, they're using it in the lay sense. For scholars, it means something slightly different. Criticism means simply to analyze a topic or a subject or an item like the Bible using the methods of an academic. And that's something else that's really important. Um, one of the things that we should know about just really being human is that we have a variety of ways of knowing, ways of coming to knowledge, of gaining knowledge about everything. And when we're looking at scripture, like the Bible, for instance, we have a variety of ways of knowing about the Bible. The Latter-day Saints, you invoke the Holy Spirit, for instance. We also just simply have reading the text. These all can give us different information about what this text is. Biblical criticism, then, emerged alongside the growth of the modern academy, universities, 
This began really in Germany in the 18th century. It reached the United States by the late 19th century. And these people use this term biblical criticism to mean that they are using specific academic methods for acquiring knowledge about the Bible. So there is not a claim that this is exhaustive, right? That this is the only way to understand the Bible, just as we wouldn't say, right, that reading the Bible is the only way you can come to knowledge of it, because Latter-day Saints emphasize prayer and the Holy Spirit as well. Academics then use a couple of different methods, and there are several that we might mention. One category is sometimes called textual criticism or literary criticism, or even historically the lower criticism, although we don't use that term anymore because it kind of implies it's not as good. This method evaluates the Bible's texts a couple of different ways. It might evaluate how the text is written, right? Interested in the literary qualities of the text, seeing if we can, ident I can identify certain genres within the text. It also, and this is textual criticism, it also might examine manuscripts of the Bible that our modern translations are, are derived from, trying to identify any changes or discrepancies over a long period of time. You know, it's important to recognize, right, that our manuscripts of the Bible are pretty fragmented. The earliest full manuscript of the Bible we have dates to several hundred years hundred years after the life and death of Jesus Christ. Earliest fragment of a Bible manuscript that we have is from the Gospel, or I'm sorry, from one of the epistles of John. It is from about 300 years after Jesus died. So what these textual critics will do is try to line up all these manuscripts and see if they're the same, see how these texts might have evolved and changed over time. Now, there's also another version of criticism of the Bible, and that's what I think we'll be talking most about today. That is called the higher criticism or more recently, historical criticism. That is interested in using the methods of academic history to study the Bible. That is, it asks, what can the methods of history, this specific way of knowing that is history, that is involving research, examination of available evidence and sources that we can footnote, that we can cite, right, and that you can go look at, what can that way of gathering knowledge reveal about the background of the history of the Bible? So, for instance, um, one of the earliest forms of this kind of criticism was practiced, as I said, in Germany in the late 18th, early 19th century, by, most famously by a man named David Strauss, who wrote a, a book about Jesus. And he tried very hard to explain what we can know about Jesus using historical evidence right? Using evidence that is verifiable, that is footnotable. I mean, he wrote a book called The Life of Jesus, which made the argument that Jesus was an apocalyptic Jewish prophet. Now, he bracketed miraculous spiritual claims about Jesus because he said, I cannot footnote that. Jesus might have been the son of God, but I cannot give you a footnote that documents that and proves that thoroughly. And so this is why higher criticism is and sometimes comes up for critique because of claims like that. Yeah, I can only imagine a footnote that says correspondence with God, 1876, February 1, right? But I think with what you've said, I can understand why it's a sensitive topic for those who believe in the Bible to be the word of God, and for Protestants especially, who believe that the Bible is the end-all be-all for religious authority. Yes, and this was one of the reasons why, especially this historical criticism, more so than textual criticism or form criticism, was so controversial in the 19th century. Many American Christians in particular found this kind of criticism threatening because it upset traditional beliefs about the Bible, that they had about the Bible. And it might be useful here to separate the Bible itself from beliefs we have about it, right? There is the text itself. But then there are presumptions about the text or faith claims about the text. Some of these scholars argued that these forms of criticism actually help us understand the Bible better, that they help us understand what its initial writers intended when they wrote the Bible. And hence, some of these critics would say this sort of work is actually faith-promoting because it helps us understand who Jesus was better, what the gospel writers wanted us to understand about Jesus that it might actually deepen our faith to properly understand, for instance, that there is a creation story in Genesis 1 and a creation story in Genesis 2. And those creation stories are somewhat different 
And some form critics might say, we have these two creation stories because they're designed to teach us different things about and our relationship with and who God is. And that's why we have two, for the same reason there are four Gospels. There are, certainly, there were some of these academic scholars, like David Strauss, who I mentioned a bit earlier, who believed that higher criticism, historical criticism, debunked traditional beliefs of Christianity. Many higher critics argued because the methods of history do not include miracles, we have to understand Jesus as a figure bounded by his historical time, rather than as a divine exception. And that was very, very hard for many American Christians in the 19th century to accept, particularly many American evangelicals. And indeed, the theology of what's sometimes called biblical inerrancy emerged as a reaction to these sorts of criticism. So what does that mean, biblical inerrancy? Biblical inerrancy was not really a well-defined theological belief before the 19th century. It came to be defined by scholars, especially at Princeton Theological Seminary in the late 19th century, as a way to debunk historical criticism. Biblical inerrancy is the notion that the Bible is inerrant in all that it claims. Now, people will often use the word biblical literalism, right, to kind of mean something like this, but that's not quite the same thing. Biblical inerrantists will acknowledge that the Bible indeed does contain metaphor and analogy. But their point is, when it intends to be metaphorical, it is metaphor. When it is claiming issues of historical fact, it is inerrant. And these theologians developed that claim, wrote articles and books defending it because they saw what this criticism to be doing to be detrimental to faith. And it's still an issue, of course. There are many, many arguments, even up to today, about how we should think about these issues. And I think in many ways, it's a, it's a tension, right? It's a tension that may not be resolved, but hopefully, both for scholars and for believers, it's a tension that may prove productive because it makes us think about scripture more carefully. Certainly. So we are speaking with Dr. Matthew Bowman about his article, Biblical Criticism, The Book of Mormon and the Meanings of Civilization. Matt, how did Latter-day Saints first encounter biblical criticism? Uh, I believe that George Reynolds factors in. Could you tell us about him and his experience? Yeah, absolutely. So the earliest Latter-day Saint responses to the higher criticism particularly, you start to see emerging at about the same time that many other Protestants began engaging with this. That is the 1870s. And as with many other American Christians, Latter-day Saints felt that these forms of criticism, particularly the higher criticism, were threatening and dangerous and destructive of faith. They adopted, in many ways, arguments that other Protestants made that linked higher criticism and biblical criticism to the theory of evolution, to geology that was making the case that the earth was far older than scripture seemed to imply. And thus, they saw all of these things going hand in hand, bringing unbelief and lack of faith, and the destruction of Christianity in America. And this is, of course, something that many, many Protestant denominations are fighting over. Some Protestant denominations, like the Presbyterians and the Baptists, even fracture over many of these issues. So I think that's really interesting for a few reasons. One, Reynolds is not a trained academic. He's not someone who is entering into these conversations looking for the same sorts of solutions that Strauss is in Germany or that others are at Harvard or at Princeton or Yale or other places of higher learning. Do you think that that's a fair statement? Now, the Latter-day Saints believed that they had another tool in this argument, and that tool was the Book of Mormon. Interestingly enough, they were willing, uh, because of the Eighth Article of Faith, right, which claims that we believe in the Bible um, so far as it is translated correctly, and because of the Joseph Smith translation as well of the Bible, right, that the Bible might be corrupted in some way, that there might be textual criticism that would be useful for untangling, right, what the Bible really meant to say. But they believed because they had the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon was immune to all of this. We'll see early Latter-day Saints like George Reynolds, right, who was president of what was then the Desert Sunday School Union, making the case that, and I will quote him here, that the Book of Mormon confirms Bible history, demonstrates Bible truth, sustains Bible doctrines, and fulfills Bible prophecy, right? So his argument was that the Book of Mormon could defend and save the Bible 
from this sort of criticism. For instance, uh, because the Book of Mormon makes reference to the five books of Moses, Reynolds believed then that higher critics and textual critics who were making the argument that those first five books of the Hebrew Bible, beginning with Genesis, ending with Deuteronomy, were actually the product of several different authors whose work was gradually fused together over time, that that was untrue for George Reynolds, because the Book of Mormon said, these are the books of Moses. Similarly, for instance, Reynolds argued that the Book of Mormon did indeed in some ways parallel the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew and a similar speech that Jesus gives in the Gospel of Luke. But Reynolds said the Book of Mormon gives us the pure version of that speech. And so we can turn to the Book of Mormon and see then the higher criticism. Another autodidact, another early leader of the church who is a great intellectual is B.H. Roberts. And he undertakes a study of the Book of Mormon where he tries to involve biblical criticism. Could you tell us about Elder Roberts' intellectual journey? Yeah, Elder Roberts is fascinating, right? There are those who will say that B.H. Roberts is still the best mind the church has ever produced. He Certainly, he was an autodidact, but he read widely, he read deeply, a very, very penetrating and powerful mind. And initially, he follows many of these other Latter-day Saints in rejecting the higher criticism and saying that it is destructive of faith. Fortunately, we have the Book of Mormon, which will disprove it. But gradually, actually, he starts to shift his position. And that, I think, does demonstrate a lot of intellectual honesty on his part. I think he begins to see that a lot of the work of the higher criticism just mounts and mounts and mounts. And it becomes, I think, harder and harder and harder simply to dismiss out of hand. By the early 20th century, then, he has done much more reading. And he and a few other members of the church begin to take a more measured approach. They begin to concede that, in fact, the higher criticism can and does provide useful information, that there's something here worth looking at, and indeed, perhaps even a method worth studying. But ultimately, Roberts believed these tools and this approach can be used to validate and explore scripture, to understand it better. He eventually comes to argue that the faith claims that the higher criticism might damage are themselves flimsy and improper. He says the higher criticism is destroying weak Christianity, weak Christian beliefs about the Bible. But ultimately, he thinks it will validate the inspired nature of real pure scripture. I think that's an interesting tack to take because as a modern Latter-day Saint, I know people in my ward or in my stake who still aren't comfortable with this sort of thing. And I would say that they have a deep and abiding faith in scripture. They are just not interested in scripture for the same reasons. Yeah, certainly. You know, Roberts does, I think, come to take higher criticism extremely seriously. He does not subscribe to all of its claims, right, to some of the things that that academics he disagreed with were saying, but he does think that the method is interesting and important. And particularly, really, when it comes to the Book of Mormon. Because, of course, Roberts does eventually begin applying some of these methods to the Book of Mormon. That is, exploring archaeological work in Central and South America, looking at the history of indigenous peoples in the Americas, and expecting, then, that this sort of work will reveal more truth about the Book of Mormon. There are some Latter-day Saint leaders, like John Whitsow, who think this is wonderful and want to pursue this and are very confident that this kind of thing will validate the Book of Mormon. There are others, though, like James Talmadge, who don't seem to see much point in it. James Talmadge attends a meeting that Roberts convenes um, in 1921, I believe, or 1922, one of those two, and, uh, and Roberts presents some of the, these evidences and also some of the troubles that he is finding as he's doing some of this work. And Talmadge famously goes home and writes in his journal, and I'm paraphrasing him here, he says essentially, the Book of Mormon says there were horses in the Americas when Lehi and his family arrived here. Therefore, they must have been here, even if archaeologists are finding no evidence. That's fascinating because... I think about Talmadge as being involved in writing Jesus the Christ, in being involved in Protestant and some Catholic scholarship to better help Latter-day Saints understand their faith. And yet he's disagreeing with Roberts. I think 
in some ways that this shows that we can't paint anyone into a corner. No one is 100% ideological on any issue, much less a range of issues as complicated as, as faith and belief. Precisely. You know, there was a spectrum. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about, right, this sort of academic study that Roberts is doing is a way that he approaches his faith. And it's extremely important to Roberts to the point, right, where he calls in all the general authorities and says, we need to talk about it. And that's very, very key and central for him. It doesn't bother Talmadge. Talmadge goes on his own path, right? And and I don't think, you know, who's to say, like, who's right, who's wrong? I don't know that right or wrong is a real a right way to think about this. Rather, languages, I think. Languages of faith. Languages of intellect. That's the right way to conceive of what's going on. Some people speak in a different language. So there are right, a kind of range of responses to this. There are some church leaders like Talmadge who are comfortable simply resting in their faith. Um, there are others like Witso who believe that this sort of exploration can deepen and expand their knowledge of the Book of Mormon and hence their faith. Okay, so something that Roberts gets into, as you say, he's investigating the history and the anthropology of America's indigenous peoples. And he's also adopting ideas around civilization that are popular in intellectual currents at the time. How did ideas about civilization factor into the search for tangible or historical proof of the Book of Mormon's truth as scripture? This notion of civilization, right? That's a thing that I think a lot of modern people have thought, and you know, that's a concept we've had forever. But actually, our ideas about civilization and what it is have really changed over time. And in the late 19th century, that notion, the idea of civilization, was really central to what a lot of academics and intellectuals were doing in a wide variety of fields. And many of them had incorporated some ideas from Darwinism, um, from the notion of progression, of survival of the fittest, right? And, and they said, well, if this is true for individual species, it might be true for groups of people, even. Uh, perhaps civilizations progress. Perhaps there are more advanced civilizations. There are civilizations who fail, civilizations who rise. This way of thinking was really, really central to Roberts, um, as it was for many people who were doing work on the Bible in this period as well. They tended to think of ancient peoples evolving over time. And they said, what we see in the Bible is the evolution of the family of Abraham from these very early, in a word they use was primitive, ways of understanding God and being religious to the purity of Christianity. And that idea is still implicit, I think, in a, the ways a lot of Christians talk about their relationship with Judaism and the relationship of the New Testament to the Hebrew Bible, right? That there's a lower law, a higher law, right? That, that is this civilizational language. And Roberts believed it. He uses this idea, then, to look at the Book of Mormon. And it is actually one of the issues that causes him some difficulty. One of the things that Roberts and other Americans in the 19th century believed about civilization was that aspects of civilization moved in tandem. So as a civilization progressed in their religion, away from what all of these people said was like early ritualism towards higher purity uh, and ethical behavior, their economics, their form of government, their family life, their technology, all of these things should progress in tandem. So civilizations who are really advanced in their form of government, for instance, Roberts and other Americans expected, would also be more advanced in their religion and in their technology and so on. Low civilizations were like in the Stone Age, they would also be despotic. Higher civilizations would have democracy and science at the same time. So for Roberts and other readers of the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon civilizations, which reportedly had steel, had Christianity, the Nephites, right, eventually adopt a system of judges and move away from kingship. Roberts thought then that the Nephite civilization was a higher civilization, and he expected then that in the archaeological and cultural and historical remnants, he would see evidence of that. And there were Latter-day Saints who went to Central and South America looking for that archaeological evidence. Is that right? There were, yes. Um, they were really drawing on 
the ideas of a mostly British, but also American school of archaeology that historians sometimes call the biblical archaeologists or the school of biblical archaeology. These were people who thought that the German method of studying the Bible, that is, which developed textual criticism and higher criticism, was paying far too much attention to the text itself. And what we really needed to do if we wanted to understand the Bible was actually start to dig and do archaeology and find the actual physical remnants. Um, there were a lot of biblical archaeologists, people like William Albright, who did a lot of work um, in Israel trying to under uncover the evidence of the Israelite invasion of Canaan that happens in the book of Joshua. I mean, one of his students uncovered several cities, most famously Shechem, um, which is mentioned several times in the Old Testament, right? These people thought that the archaeological evidence and the stories in the text would just click together, right? And be mutually reinforcing. The Bible would explain the sites, the sites would justify the Bible. That was their strategy. And there were Latter day Saints who were involved in this. Most famously in this period was the Clough Expedition, mounted by Benjamin Clough, who was the president of BYU. In 1900, he led a lot of students and some other faculty at BYU down through Mexico. And they went, they went through Central America looking for archaeological evidence of the Book of Mormon. Now, they didn't find it, in part because they didn't really know what they were doing. Benjamin Clough was a, was a mathematician, not an archaeologist, right? They, were, they had more enthusiasm than training, we might say. Uh, but their hope really indicates how members of the church are engaging with a lot of these ways of studying the Bible popular in America. So what sort of evidence are they looking for? You said that they have more enthusiasm than training, but are they looking for horse skeletons or examples of steel? What kind of things are they even looking for to prove that civilization had progressed, to use their terminology? Yeah, yeah, and that's a good way to ask it, right? Because, because the, the real goal here is to find cities. Cities are proof of civilization. And highly advanced cities, cities that show evidence of class stratification of workers and rich people and clergy and all this other stuff, these are described in the Book of Mormon. The ultimate goal for so many of these people is Zarahemla. If you can find the city of Zarahemla, right, then you will demonstrate the truth of the Book of Mormon. They did not, unfortunately. So Roberts knows that Clough wasn't able to find Zarahemla and that no one else has been able to find these ancient cities described in the Book of Mormon. How does he work through this? Because it seems that as a general authority, as a man of faith, he has a testimony of the Book of Mormon in the same way that many Latter-day Saints gain it through Moroni's promise, asking in faith and then receiving an answer. But so what does this do? Does this bother him at all? Somewhat. Some ways yes, some ways no. Um, he is not comfortable trying to pinpoint geographical locations of the Book of Mormon. Roberts points to the evidence in the text of great upheavals in the land, earthquakes, cities falling, that sort of thing, and says locating Zarahemla may be hard because of that. So he doesn't think that's necessarily the way to go. He's looking for other things. Well, he, he spends a lot of time, for instance, on the story of Quetzalcoatl, which, has become po which really became popular among Latter-day Saints in the 20th century, the notion that Quetzalcoatl was a kind of cultural memory of Jesus Christ for instance. That's more the kind of thing I think he is emphasizing. He is, though, a little bit thrown by a letter that actually James Talmadge receives and passes off to him that he receives from a young Latter-day Saint named William uh, Ryder, who's living in Washington, D.C. in 1921. And Ryder asks Roberts a bunch of questions about seeming anachronisms in the Book of Mormon, the presence of steel, for instance, which is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, but for which there's no archaeological evidence of steel existing in the Americas before Columbus. The mention of horses, which is the same problem. The mention of silk, same problem. Roberts grapples with most of these, and he engages pretty well, right? He says that there is some evidence for something like horses, something like steel, and at least enough evidence that he is comfortable. Other Latter-day Saints, Saints have said, well, these things might simply be translation issues more than actual references to steel, right? But the real thing that pulls Roberts up is language. One of 
the questions that he's asked in this letter is, how is it that only a thousand years after the collapse of the Nephite civilization, are there so many different Native American languages on the continent that seem to have no relationship with each other? And that does throw Roberts a little bit, because remember, he's expecting the Nephites to be an advanced civilization, one with writing. Right, a civilization that has a kind of fixed, firm language that's maintained through text, not simply oral developments. And he thinks about a, a number of different possibilities. He actually refers to one that later became embraced by many members of the church, and that's uh, what is often called today the limited geography. The idea that the Book of Mormon happens in a relatively small area of land, and that there are other groups of people not mentioned in the Book of Mormon living all over the Americas at the same time that this is happening. Now, Roberts has a very, very kind of rigorous mind, and he says he cannot fully accept this uh, because those other peoples are not mentioned in the Book of Mormon. He is very faithful to the text in that way. But there are other leaders of the church and other thinkers in the church who find this option more appealing. That's interesting because this echoes so much of many conversations that I hear as a Latter-day Saint today. Debates over what sort of evidences we should rely upon to prove to ourselves or prove to others that scripture is true. I personally sort of savor and love that Elder Roberts said, I'm not fully satisfied with this, but I know what I've received as a spiritual answer and continuing to participate in the church and find his way the best that he could. I know, speaking for myself, there are things in the church that I'm hoping to receive answers to, things in my life that I'm hoping for additional light to be shed on. But it's about having the hope that all will be revealed later. Is that a little bit about how Elder Roberts felt, or do we get a sense for how it factored into his spiritual life in that way? Sure. You know, we, we do know that Roberts was troubled by this, but I don't know that we can easily equate him being troubled by it with the sense that, oh, well, he doesn't believe in the Book of Mormon anymore. That, that is a bridge further, I think, than he himself would have gone. And certainly, right, he was comfortable engaging with other leaders in the church on this and saying, well, here are some problems. Here are some questions that I have. What do you think? What do you think? You know, and he has exchanges with a lot of leaders in the church who all seem to have different answers. Another Latter-day Saint scholar who has had a long-term effect on the trajectory of Latter-day Saints understanding the Book of Mormon is Sidney Sperry. Could you tell us more about him? Yeah, Sperry is interesting. You know, he is a generation younger than Roberts. He is actually the first of a small cohort of educators in the church educational system who go to the University of Chicago and receive advanced degrees there in various aspects of religion. Sperry actually studied linguistics. He got his PhD in 1931. And he takes a really different tack than Roberts does or than Benjamin Pluck does. He is more interested in that earlier first type of criticism that I mentioned, that category that includes textual criticism, literary criticism, linguistic and form criticism, looking at the text itself. He uses language and really believes that language can bypass archaeology to get at what the text is all about. So Sperry is interested in looking at the Book of Mormon and reading it very closely. And he unearths what he argues is a number of different forms in the Book of Mormon, that is, different types of writing. He dubs Third Nephi the American Gospel or the Nephite Gospel and says it has all the forms that a gospel as a form of writing that we know from the Bible would have. Um, he calls that passage in 2 Nephi 4 the Psalm of Nephi, because he says if you compare it to the Psalms in the Hebrew Bible, you will see similar patterns, similar forms, right? similar use of language. He argues overall that the Book of Mormon has the markers of being what he calls translation literature, that it reads like a text that has been translated from one language into another. That is the path down which he takes study of the Book of Mormon. And it's interesting to see, I think, that we can see the legacies of some of these different schools of how to properly study the Book of Mormon still at work and alive today. Could you say more about that? How do Latter-day Saint leaders think today, or at least teach today, about archaeological evidence and the Book of Mormon? Well, you know, I think um, leaders and Latter-day Saints are two different categories there. 
But overall, right, Latter-day Saint leaders have been pretty rigorously neutral about it. But they will say things like, you know, we don't know where exactly the Book of Mormon happened. That matters less than what the Book of Mormon's message is. But there are certainly many groups in the church who are following still these various paths, right? There is still a number of thinkers and writers in the church who do what Sidney Sperry has done, right? And who look really closely at the text and who unearth, I think, some really fascinating and valuable insights into the Book of Mormon from that kind of close, rigorous analysis of the text. There have also been many camps within the church who have done pursued further archaeological work, trying to find evidence and, and understanding of the Book of Mormon in those ways as well. And there have been many historians or students of history in the church who have compared what we know about Book of Mormon civilizations to the civilizations of the ancient Near East or the ancient Americas. All of these are ways, I think, of finding your way into the text, understanding the text better, and trying to develop a deeper, I think, relationship with it um, if one is reading the text in pursuit of greater. What are some of the big ideas about history and religion that you take away from researching this period, these sorts of stories in church history? What are, say, two or three things that we should take away? Sure. I think the first thing we can learn from this story is that despite what we all may say, no one is simply reading the text. You cannot simply point to the uh, passage in the Bible or the Book of Mormon and say its meaning is self-evident and clear. And it obviously says this or it says that. Because all of us are bringing certain assumptions and expectations, things that we might even not be aware of as we approach these texts. And I think one of the really valuable ways to come to a better relationship with the sacred text is to come to understand yourself and what you're assuming when you read it, what you're expecting when you read it. Let the text surprise you. I used to teach, actually, an undergraduate course in the Hebrew Bible, in what Christians call the Old Testament. And one of the exercises I did at the very beginning of the class was I told um, my students the story of Noah. As we all have come to assume, we know it, that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and Noah brought um, a pair of male and female of every animal species onto the ark, and the ark rode the waves for 40 days and 40 nights, and so on. But when I say that, nearly everything I've said just now when recounting that story is not actually in the Bible. Um, it's, it's not the assumptions we bring to the Bible, and, and, our, and our belief that we know the text perhaps better than we actually do. So that's maybe a good second lesson here, is I think returning to the text itself and trying to read it carefully to strip away our assumptions about what we know is in it actually makes for a much richer um, and better informed um, and hopefully more fruitful encounter. And I have one final question for you that we like to ask of all our guests on the Maxwell Institute podcast. In section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, we read about learning from the best books. What are three of your best books that you would recommend to Maxwell Institute podcast listeners? Oh, well, I'll, I'll speak especially, I think, to this question, right, of scripture and reading scripture and learning from scripture. The first, I think, for anyone who wants to know more about the Book of Mormon and to understand the Book of Mormon better would be Grant Hardy's book, Understand. Um, Hardy is very much working in the tradition of Sidney Sperry, which is to say a close and detailed reading of the text itself, of its forms, of its patterns, of its repetitions. And he unearths, I think, things in it that would, I think, be really happy surprises to many of other basic listeners. Another would be James Kugel's book. James Kugel is a professor of Hebrew Bible. He is actually Jewish himself, but his book, How to Read the Bible, is intended for lay readers. But it is, I think, a very, very valuable and educational examination of some of these same patterns, right? He moves through the Bible, and it tells us what these various forms of criticism have revealed, or what we might learn about these various stories in the Bible. And one thing he does that I think is very valuable is that he doesn't say this reading is the correct. Rather, I think he tells us that all of these different ways to read it have opened multiple readings of all of these stories. And again, these make scripture seem much more 
relevant, I think, and fresh. Um, and then finally, I would recommend really any of the works of Raymond Brown on the news. Um, Raymond Brown, I think he, um, he is recently deceased. He was a preeminent scholar of the New Testament. who's also practicing Roman Catholic. Um, and his work on the New Testament is really magnificent and carries, I think, with it a lot of these same ideas and this same kind of ability, I think, to look at, as B.H. Roberts was really trying to do, to use these academic tools in such a way to deepen and make more meaningful things. Thank you, Matt, for coming by the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you do us a favor and recommend this show to others? Review and rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or other podcast providers or share the episode on social media. Thanks so much and have a blessed week, y'all.